author opinion of Dennis Keen at the history, geography and architecture, culture and life matters of Kazakhs in the program Discovering Kazakhstan. On today's episode, a one-of-a-kind coal mine museum, a hotel for cosmonauts, and Karaganda's Soviet legacy. Salam, Privyet, and hello. I'm Dennis King, and today on Discovering Kazakhstan, we will be discovering the coal capital of the country, Karaganda. This is a city that is known for its coal reserves, but that is certainly not all. It has some of the most interesting museums in the country, a trove of Soviet art and architecture, and a special connection to space travel. Come along as we explore this special city in central Kazakhstan, both underground and above. When we were planning our trip to Karaganda, I put a call out on social media to ask if anybody had any advice for things to do and see in Karaganda. And the response was amazing. We had dozens of suggestions. It was clear that people love this city. And one piece of advice that we had came from Daniyar Sabitov. He said, the Museum of Ecology is very good. So, Daniar, a shout out to you. Thanks for the advice. We have come to the museum. We're going to go check it out. Some museums in Kazakhstan can be very conservative from the point of view of a Western tourist like me. Everything is behind glass, serious guides with pointer sticks recite encyclopedia entries and scold you if you get too close to something interesting. The Karaganda Eco Museum has become famous for turning this all on its head. Here you can touch everything and even have a lot of fun, all while learning about the important environmental issues facing central Kazakhstan. We met the museum's founder, Dmitry Kolmikov, and he told us about his museum's inspiring philosophy. Uh, visitors and children especially can do what they want and touch what they want and play in with this. We're interested to create some very optimistic view of possibility to change the world and do what they want with this world. And to do that, you first need to get their attention. And I know any kid who comes to this museum immediately will come to here, start turning things around. I'm sure their parents get nervous that some alarms are going to go off. But you can actually touch any of these things in here. Yeah, 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 you're yeah, right. As much as you like. At, at first, even not take attention, but first it's woke up, wake up, right. <laughs> wake up. At, if people interested and children interested, we start to try and produce some useful information. Though the museum is housed in one big room, it's packed full of fascinating and fun exhibits. Dmitry showed me a mock bomb shelter for nuclear tests, an exercise bike for keeping Soviet scientists in shape while in their bunkers, and all sorts of crazy pieces of space trash, objects that have fallen from space flights and rockets onto the steppe of Kazakhstan. The largest exhibit at the museum is hidden in a kind of trap door below the floor, and Dmitry and his team built a special contraption, complete with loud sirens, that brings it above ground for the tour's final reveal. The sirens are kind of terrifying, actually. Yeah, that's real, actual military alarm sound here wow. from Soviet base. Well, I have to say that was quite an entrance. I've never seen a museum exhibit pop out of the ground like that before. The sirens were a little bit unnerving, but I think it was worth the wait. I just have one question. What is it? It is a gift from the space. <laughs> you can find it just in the space, but it's uh, this part of rockets has very long story. Of course, you heard about United States and Soviet Union moon race. It is legacy of uh, this moon race. Uh, unfortunately, Soviet Union can't build rockets that go in, that can go into the moon. But some parts of these rockets 
still used just now. In 99 years, during one year, proton rockets exploded twice per year and fall down in the vicinity of Karaganda. And local villagers call for a museum and say something like um, U4, we've right. <laughs> discovered in our villages, it's fall down from the space. It's not the same thing like me, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> It's, but it's a, quite a treasure to have hidden here underneath the floorboards of your museum. And I can see you know, what an experience this must be for kids who come to the Eco Museum in Karaganda, to be able to touch, to be able to look, to be able to ask questions, and to have so many discoveries like this. I'm glad that you guys are doing what you're doing and kind of trying to uh, spread the knowledge and wake people up, as you say. Until recently, the Karaganda College of Mining and Industry has never been a major tourist attraction. After all, it's a place for students with classrooms and lecture halls. But it does have an underground mine used for training that's been underutilized ever since it was made in 1981. And just last year, some people from the administration thought, let's make this into a museum. And ever since, it has been a hit with tourists. We actually got a tip from my friend Asel Omar Lievo when I asked for some advice on things to see, and she said to go see the mines because they are the heart of Karaganda. But I was a bit troubled about what to do because it's not actually easy to get inside these mines. I mean, they're operated by big international companies. There are certain health and safety regulations. So when we heard about this Karaganda Mine Museum, it seemed like too good of a chance to pass up. Before you get to put on a uniform and get down into the mine itself, first you're treated to the actual museum, where there are a variety of exhibits about the history of coal mining in Karaganda, from the very beginning to the modern day. And when I say the very beginning, I mean all the way back to the first discovery of coal in Karaganda. They actually have the name of the gentleman who discovered it, a nomad named Apak Bajanov. It's said that he was camping one day by the side of a river, found a black stone and threw it in his campfire, and boo it ignited. And he realized that this was what they would call black gold. And this was the beginning of the history of coal mining in this entire region. The vast majority of coal miners were always men. But there was a very special time in the history of Karaganta coal when women took over. It was during World War II, when most of the men were fighting on the front lines against the Nazis for the Red Army. Because so many women were still here in Karaganda, they used this extra labor to work the mines. And you can see here photographs of some of these famous female coal miners who really made a mark during these war years. It even says that at one point in 1942, 16% of the entire female population of Karaganda was working under the ground. And this is what everybody was after, that brilliant Karaganda coal. It turns out that there are actual different varieties of coal, and each of them have interesting names. Going back to some of the earliest varieties that were discovered, which were named after the daughter of one of the French businessmen who opened up the mines, which is why we have a kind here called Lower Mariana and one here called Upper Mariana. Other varieties we have here are called Felix or Wonderful. One of the last cool exhibits that we can look at is a mine telephone, which is not your average telephone. First of all, in my hands, it's really quite heavy, and it's made from this thick metal. The reason is, is that everything in a mine has to be super safe in case there's any kind of accidents or explosions. So there are very strict regulations about how any kind of equipment would be built. Everything has to be done super heavy duty. Now, as fascinating as the museum exhibits are, I just can't wait to actually get here into the locker room and play dress up. I get my own little miner's jacket here that I could put on. 
and this is made to be especially thick because it's actually quite cold here now that we've come down below the earth. It's got some reflective material for safety. I've got my hard hat. And then lastly, what we need is a light. After all, it's quite dark down there. So over here, you can hear this humming. These are all the miners' lights being charged for the night. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna take one off just like this. I've got my own light and I'm ready to go. If tall buildings have elevators, then mines have what are called mine cages. We're now in this kind of mine shaft elevator, which is going to take us 15 meters below the ground. And here is the big moment. We are down below the ground. We have come to the training mine. Let's go check it out. You know, when I came down here, I kind of had this quaint notion that we were going to be given hand picks and we would start digging away at the walls of the mine ourselves. But then I realized we're not in the 19th century anymore. This is the 21st century and we have machines to do the work for us. This is a special machine that's called a driving combine. And this head here with these big heavy tooths can drill into this wall much quicker and more effectively than I can, even in my own dreams. In a minute, the guide is gonna turn this on and we're gonna see just how powerful this machine really is. that has started to writhe behind me is actually the ventilation system of the mine. Of course, when you're working in such an enclosed space, it's very important to keep track of the contents of the air. So this kind of black snake here is sucking in some fresh air from above to keep the miners safe. is trying to prepare its students to get ready for a whole professional career in the mines, they're trying to make it as realistic as possible. So they've got speakers playing these sounds that you would hear in a mine. You've got mannequins where the guys are set up at each of the different stations. Now what's remarkable, if you think about it, is that this big machine can't possibly be brought down here into one piece. That lift that we came in is just not big enough. So instead, it has to be brought down here piece by piece and then assembled by engineers below the ground. In Soviet Karaganda, the proletariat was seen as noble and wise, and miners were expected to be as educated and cultured as the rest of society. In central Karaganda, you can find a magnificent building called the Miner's Palace of Culture that is a testament to this idea. These Soviet palaces of culture were centers of music, theater, and art. They were mostly built during the Stalinist era, when the architectural style trended towards classicism, with grand porticos of columns and socialist realist statues. With its scale and level of ornament, the buildings feel like temples. And this really is a temple, a temple to the men who worked under this city and gave it a reason for being. Standing above the colonnade like a team of superheroes are statues of a miner, a shepherd, a soldier, a farmer, a builder, and a Dombra player. Indeed, these were the heroes of the Soviet Union, the workers who made this city into a major megalopolis, complete with a palace. The interiors of Stalinist buildings were notoriously ornate, a way to show off the supposed abundance that had been brought by the Soviet system. That meant 
grand sparkling chandeliers, tons of Cossack ornament everywhere. And in this case, an unusual screen made of gypsum plaster and glass, in the center of which we have a dancing Cossack girl with long braids and a scarf in her hand. The artistic decoration continues in the stairway, where there's a more modern mural that shows some landmarks from Karaganda, including the Miner's Palace of Culture itself. When Nikolai Mogilevsky, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Soviet Kazakhstan, came to Karaganda, he made a wry observation. Such are the people of Karaganda, he said. They work underground, live underground, and even pray underground. Deported men who worked in the mines during the day would use whatever spare time they could find to build zemlanki, or earth dugouts, building homes in the ground because there were no forests on the steppe to provide timber. Despite the strict restrictions on religion during the early Soviet years, Karagandinians would meet secretly in these dugouts to hold mass. During World War II, Stalin loosened the rules on religion, and local people were allowed to build a church, one of the first ever built during the Soviet era. It was built from 1949 to 1954 by the miners themselves, using whatever strength they could find after a long day underground. In a way, the church was still built from the Karaganda soil, because as the workers had so little in the way of building materials, they would fill wooden planks with soil as a way to fortify the building. The city's mine number two lay directly under this neighborhood, one of the oldest in Karaganda. As the mine was gradually exploited, the land began to sink. Everywhere, that is, except for under the church, as here the miners had refused to dig. Now, the church of Michael the Archangel stands as a lonely relic of a now forgotten neighborhood. The church has a tall bell tower accessible by an outdoor staircase and from the top there is a view over what is left of this neighborhood that was once known as mine number two. In addition to the great view of this part of Karaganda, you can also get up close to the beautiful bronze bells that are used by the Russian church. A special member of the clergy, called a zvanar, comes up to this bell tower, pulls on these cables that are connected to the clappers, and calls the faithful to a church that many of them might have built with their own hands. This holiday had brought dozens of locals to the church, and the place was full of pious energy. It felt unlike any church I've been to in Kazakhstan, perhaps because the community fought so hard to build this place themselves and give it meaning.
Kazakhstan is home to millions of Christians, but the vast majority of them belong to the Orthodox Church. A Catholic church like Karaganda's Cathedral of Our Lady of Fatima is a rarity, but it reflects the unique demographic history of this city. Catholic Germans, Poles, and Ukrainians were among the dozens of ethnic groups sent by Stalin to Karlag, the Soviet labor camp near Karaganda, many of them specifically for observing their Catholic faith. When they left the camp, many of them settled in the city. And at one point, nearly half of Karaganda's population consisted of Catholic ethnic groups. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, most of them migrated back to their motherlands in Europe. But a big enough group stayed in Karaganda to build this cathedral in 2012. The style may seem an odd fit for Karaganda, but the church's triumphal appearance is supposed to commemorate the Catholic victims of Karlag, showing the victory of faith over those who sought to extinguish it. With its tall windows with lancet arches and its huge vaulted ceiling, the space inside the church feels airy, light, and sacred. And it's a popular place for Karagandinians to come and be alone with their thoughts and prayers. For me, the most beautiful part of any Catholic cathedral is its organ and the instrument at the Cathedral of Our Lady of Fatima does not disappoint. It was built in 2010 by an Austrian company called Pflüger and is one of the last of its kind as this company soon went out of business. That means that this is a true rarity and with 247 pipes, the sounds that come out of this are heavenly. As a history buff, one of the things that I love about Kazakhstan is that so many historic buildings are covered in commemorative plaques. Granite and marble slabs that say such and such famous person stayed here or such and such famous person lived here. And there's one building in Karaganda, the Chaika Hotel, that is just totally covered in these plaques. And it gets even weirder when you get up close and you read the plaques, because each one of these people stayed in this hotel on their first night back to Earth from space. This place was nicknamed the Cosmonauts Hotel because so many cosmic explorers would come here after their journey to space. But why were these cosmonauts coming to a place like Karaganda in the middle of Kazakhstan? The city was actually nicknamed the Space Harbor of the USSR because it was the largest big city close to Baikonur, the so-called Cosmodrome or a spaceport where cosmonauts would take off in rockets to space and eventually land nearby. Obviously tired after such an epic journey, the cosmonauts would be brought here where they would be given a post-trip rehabilitation and take part in press conferences. Perhaps the most famous cosmonaut to ever stay in this building was the very first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova. And the hotel is actually named after her because her call sign was Chaika, which in Russian means seagull. The building was built in the 1940s, and when you go inside, you can feel its history. 
It has this big two-story lobby in the center with classical columns. And on the walls, there are photographs and biographies of the cosmonauts who stayed here. Nowadays, the hotel has a newer building with dozens of rooms, but tourists always ask to stay here so that they can say they slept in the same bed as a cosmonaut. The main building of the hotel was built later in 1981. And what it may be missing in the historical value that's in the older building, it more than makes up for an architectural bombast. It was built in a style that architectural historians now call late Soviet modernism, when Soviet architects were given an amazing amount of freedom to actually experiment with their architectural forms, whereas before they had been very much restricted into building the same blocky buildings. In fact, they had so much freedom that some of their design decisions were straight up bizarre, like putting what seems to be a flying saucer on top of the hotel. But though this is a hotel that has a cosmonaut themed, maybe this kind of UFO is appropriate. The centerpiece of this modernist masterpiece is called the Rotunda Room, a three-story high lobby that lies right underneath that golden UFO above. And if you look up at the top of the room, you can see a massive glass chandelier, one of the few remaining relics of the original Soviet interior design. If you hadn't noticed from the donut-shaped alien spacecraft on the roof or the round rotunda, circles are a big theme in the architecture here. That's why I especially like this spiral staircase and the beautiful circular window at the bottom. in Kazakhstan don't get much more Soviet than Karaganda. After all, it was built entirely during the Soviet Union by prisoners for an industrial workforce. That's why the city is full of Soviet relics, Soviet architecture, and Soviet art. Visitors are usually particularly attracted to the Soviet mosaics that grace many of the buildings, made of ceramic and glass, depicting scenes from industrial life from a time when workers and miners were national heroes. Unlike in other Kazakh cities where mosaics more often show nomads and native myths, Karaganda's monumental art is almost all dedicated to the workers who built the city. Looming large on the sides of Soviet buildings are miners and metallurgists, surveyors and scientists, if you go to Karaganda, look out for these monuments and see just how many you can count. Before we leave, there is one last quirky Karaganda monument that we couldn't leave out. To understand this monument, we're going to have to know a little bit of Russian. So let me break this down for you. Basically, the Russian translation of the question where rhymes with the translation for the answer in Karaganda. So, gidye gidye v Karagandye. It's kind of like saying in English, where, where, I don't care. It became a really popular phrase in the Soviet Union because Karaganda was considered to be a place kind of in the middle of nowhere with a funny name. But I hope that now that you've seen that this is a city of cosmonauts and miners and friendly folks, if anybody asks you where they can find some of the most fascinating sites in Kazakhstan, you'll answer, where? In Karaganda. Thank you for joining us today on Discovering Kazakhstan. 
Until next time, sao bo, paka, and goodbye.